My friends often refer to me as a mooey. Do you know what that means? A mooey. M-U-I, I suppose, if one has to spell it. It stands for a mine of useless information. I would personally have called it a mine of useful information. I suppose different strokes for different folks. My friends call me a movie because I would, of course, when we play board games like 30 Seconds, come up with very innovative explanations to find the answer written on the card. And so I want to introduce this morning's sermon by giving you a tidbit of mindless, uh, uh, sorry, a, a bit of useless information, rather. It is a Maori saying. Has anybody here lived in New Zealand or at least been to New Zealand? So perhaps your ear has caught this, you know, on a steep pavement or whatever. In New Zealand it is a saying for people to use this term, a three-dog night. Have you heard that idiom? A three-dog night. Where are those people who've just put up their hands saying you've been to New Zealand or even perhaps have lived there, Auntie Joy? Have you heard that term? A three-dog night. Never? Any takers? Let me explain to you what a three-dog night is. A three-dog night it, it is when it's very cold and you have to have all the dogs in your possession in your bed with you to warm you up like some kind of natural hot water bottle. I didn't know this, so you don't have to feel bad. I only found it out um, about 10 days ago or so and couldn't wait to incorporate it into some kind of preaching. So there you have it, a three-dog night. Last night was definitely a three-dog night. Every year, my birthday falls on the coldest day in the calendar for that particular year. So I didn't have to remember that it was my birthday today. The temperature told me it was my birthday. That was enough to go on. Three dog night is own, not only a Maori saying, a three dog night is also a rock group from America formed in the late 1960s. And now all of a sudden you all nodding in agreement. You didn't know the Maori thing, but just to men mention American rock groups of the late 60s, and we're all on the same page. Now, talking about a three-dog night as a rock group, a band with the man Chuck as its lead singer, what is the song that they are probably most famous for? Jeremiah was a bullfrog! <laughs> on bullfrogs, but on the Old Testament prophet, Jeremiah. Now I must confess that he's probably not my favorite prophet, simply because he was permanently in a bad mood. He was always crying about something, so if I had to ever put together a list of my favorite prophets, I don't think he would be right at the top. In fact, I doubt that he would even get to the top five. When one reads the 52 chapters in his book, the book he's responsible to, all you see is a man throwing his toys one verse after <coughs> the other. Now, I'm not sure if his depression and discouragement was 100% valid and justified, but that is the context in which he found himself. And then a while after he had written his book, the book of Jeremiah, which has 52 chapters, he remembered there was stuff that he hadn't bitched about, and so he quickly compiled the book of Lamentations <laughs> as a follow-up to his tear-soaked pages of the book which bears his name. 
Many people don't know that the Old Testament can chronologically be divided into three parts. When I asked the 8 o'clock people this, they got it wrong by giving give me the sections of the Bible, as in the Torah and then the history books and then the wisdom books and then the prophets. That's not what I'm referring to. I'm referring to the timeline of the Bible. The timeline of the Old Testament can roughly be divided into three parts. There is the pre-exile part, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, uh, the monarchy, the kings, uh, Saul, David, Solomon. And then, of course, there is the very dramatic period of the exile itself. Where God's people found themselves at the rivers of Babylon weeping 24-7. For about 70 years, or if one summarizes it, in two and, a half, uh, two and a half generations. And then, of course, they get out of exile about 500 years before Jesus. So we refer to that as the post-exilic period. We, we have some of the minor prophets. Nehemiah uh, emerged in, in that time, rebuilding the walls. And Ezra became the first scribe. When one talks about Jeremiah and the life he lived, many people's minds immediately go to the exile. There weren't many prophets active in the exile. We have Isaiah and Ezekiel, and those two were about it. But we forget that Jeremiah was pre-exile. Some of his preaching happened during exile because he was dragged on that fateful day with the rest of God's people from Jerusalem to the land between two rivers, namely the Tigris and the Euphrates. But most of his ministry actually took place before the Babylonians came down to, uh, came to break down the walls of the city. And as one studies Jeremiah, you feel like running into the hills because there's just so much negativity there and so much sadness and so much frustration and so much regret. Every now and then, however, if one perseveres, you will see that even in the dark pages of the weeping prophet, because that is what Bible scholars call him, the weeping prophet, that even in the pages of Jeremiah, there are jewels hidden in the ash. Verses that glisten with hope and light. Offering the reader the solid and sure promises of a faithful God. There was one particular verse over which I stumbled in my preparation for today. And I want to offer it to you this morning. It comes not from the book of Jeremiah, but from the ad on Lamentations. Chapter 3, verse 55. If you focus on the verses that go before, you probably want to run away as fast as your legs can carry. But if one endures, you find this verse hidden there. It surfaces from the pages of Scripture and offers courage and confidence. Lamentations 3 verse 55 says the following. I called on your name, O Lord, when I was in a time of crisis. The old versions say, when I was in the pit, or when life was the pit. I called upon your name, O Lord, when it was really not going well with me. I called upon your name, and you draw, you drew near to me. You found me there where I was sitting and you said, do not be afraid. There's something about that verse that hints that Jeremiah wasn't disillusioned and disheartened all of the time. 
perhaps 95% of the time, perhaps 98% of the time. But there were moments in his life where he awakened to the fact that God is good. Where he realized above anything else that the Lord was who he said. I made three observations in my intense study of Jeremiah over the last six days. Six days are all I have to prepare a sermon because I preach every week and so it's a little bit like a sausage machine when I give you one hour, the very next day I have to start the next one. So for, since Monday evening I have been looking with a, uh, a, 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 a magnifying glass through the pages of Jeremiah. And there are three observations that I have very clearly made. Firstly, I saw that Jeremiah blamed God for his fate. And I don't know why, but that has been scratching at me ever since, putting two and two together. He held God responsible for his horrible life. <laughs> He pointed a finger at God saying, you know what God, this is all your fault. The fact that my heart is broken and that my prayers are not being answered and that my people have been taken into terrible Babylonian captivity, this is all on you, God. There's just something that makes me feel very awkward about people blaming God for what happens to them. Mm -hmm. It makes me think of that famous book by that Jewish rabbi, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? I suppose we can all easily fall into that trap of holding God responsible for when our lives don't work out in our favor. Perhaps some of you have recently been in that place where you needed a scapegoat, where you needed a punching bag, and where you said, Lord, this is your fault. You have done this to me. This is certainly what Jeremiah did so long ago. And over and over and over again, he blames God. Have you blamed God for that disease or for that divorce? Are you holding God responsible for your failed relationship, for that toxic breakup, or for the fact that your son has lost his job or that your daughter has lost her home? Are you blaming God for that death? Are you giving God the fault for that wheelchair? Are you pointing a finger at God saying, You failed me. I'm holding you responsible. You lied to me to my face. Your promises are not true after all, God. I think this is it for me. You go your way and I go my way. It's time that our paths separate. Jeremiah fell into this very destructive trap. I suppose we all feel like blaming someone and more often than not, it is God. Let me tell you why I think that whole business of blaming God for our pain and suffering is unfair. It's unfair because all that God has ever tried to do was to bless us. All that God has ever wanted to see was us well and happy. That is God's dream for your life. And if that has not worked out, there's some kind of other explanation for that. Jeremiah eventually came to the conclusion 
that God had a good dream for his life. And so it took him right up to chapter 29 to come to that discovery. For in chapter 29 of Jeremiah we read where God speaks in the first person and says, For I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. If God's fantasy could be put in a nutshell, that would be it. So if you have convinced yourselves or convinced yourself that God is out to get you, you have a warped theology. Then it means that your concept of God is twisted and turned. For you have allowed yourself to come to a conclusion which is misplaced. All that God has ever tried to do was to build your life up, to restore you, and to see you made whole. There are other places in Scripture where we have figures shouting at God, unhappy about how God was behaving. You see, all of us have our own idea of God. And if God doesn't live up to our idea of how He should be and how He should act, then we end up disillusioned and weary. We sometimes want to shape and mold God into an idea that suits us. And too often we end up with a God being the idea of some kind of combination between financial advisor and Father Christmas with a dash of magician in the mix somewhere. That is what some of us have formed God to be in our minds. Somebody who must look after our finances, somebody who must give us nice things, and somebody who must give us what we want, where we want it, at the click of a button. It is a big challenge for many believers, including myself, to <coughs> let God be God. Luckily for us, God can take our tantrums. God can take it when we sob. God can take it when we refuse to talk to Him. God can take all our bitterness and brokenness. For often when we are at our most ugly, God is at His most beautiful. Mm -hmm. And when we are at our worst, God is at His best. You see, we must learn this lesson from Calvary because never before, like on that Good Friday had humans stooped any lower. When there was this conspiracy, this sick conspiracy to kill life with a capital L. And so while Jesus was being suspended on a Roman beam, he absorbed all our filth. He absorbed all our messed upness. He Absorbed all our depravity and said, I will not fight fire with fire. I will not go as low as you are prepared to go because I am not like you. My response to you, the sick game that you are playing is love. That is what the cross is all about. I wonder if Jeremiah eventually came to that truth. That God wasn't to blame for his problems. That God wasn't to blame for the battles he was fighting and seemingly losing. But that God was busy at work 
in his life. That God was touching his heart. So that he could learn to trust even when he couldn't see. I don't think it's right or fair for any of us to blame God for anything bad that happens to us. <clears throat> for God is determined to make his plans for your life work out. And God, as far as I know, is not going to rest until every single purpose for your life has been fulfilled. Do me one favor. Try and not be like Jeremiah, bitching all over the place and blaming God for stuff that God was never a part of. God's guarantee to you is this. That he is preparing a future for you. A future that you are not even aware of. And rumor on the street has it. That the tomorrow that God readies for us is always better than today. The second observation that I gleaned from the pages of Jeremiah would, would probably be this. Not only did he do this this awful thing of blaming God for what was happening to him, he also allowed his emotions to get the better of him. Now, I'm the last one who should be accusing people of being emotional because I am a very emotional person myself, perhaps too emotional. I even cry when checkers closes early. <laughs> but that's just me. <coughs> we have to what would the term be? Sort out, I suppose. We have to clarify what goes on inside of us. Because often there's a tug of war between our hearts and our minds. Our hearts are emotional things. They're not toys. And they can go up and down like a yo-yo. And we find our feelings treating us on a bit of a roller coaster. I want you to know today that it is very unhelpful letting your feelings inform what you believe about God. Are you hearing me? We shouldn't do that. Your feelings should not inform you about what God is like. Because your feelings change. They are erratic and volatile and unpredictable. Rather let your mind tell you the truths about God, which are still true even when your life is falling apart. For it doesn't matter how unfavorable your circumstances are. Ask Jeremiah, for instance. Your feelings will do this. One minute you're feeling happy, the next minute you're feeling devastated, and you don't know what to do with yourself. Don't allow your sense of uncertainty or your sense of concern or your sense of fear for the future to make you forget what God said. When you read Lamentations chapter 3, it's basically a non-starter. I would rather read the book of Deuteronomy than... Lamentations. And that says a lot. In Lamentations, we have this thing where Jeremiah blames God, firstly, we've looked at that. And secondly, then he just goes on and on and on about the emotions he is feeling inside. And he uses very dramatic language. He says things like, my tears have been my food day and night. It says things like, there's crying in the streets and my tongue sticks to the palate of my mouth. And so he goes on and on like a poet without a pause. Then all of a sudden he changes gear. There is this enormous shift 
when one gets to verse 19. So it's all bad, 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 all sad, 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 all depressed, 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 all the prophet feeling dead, um, shattered, shattered, shattered. And then in verse 19 of Lamentations 3, he writes this. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. His mercies are new every morning. There's something very special about me quoting these verses to you on my birthday. Because of the Lord's great love, I have not been consumed. His mercies are new every single morning. And then the prophet does something interesting. Then he goes into prayer mode. He doesn't say great is his faithfulness. All of a sudden it becomes a conversation with God. He says great is your faithfulness, O Lord. I want to pause today in this prayerful city where I want my heart to do cartwheels as I give thanks for my life. And for God's enduring, unwavering, and unerring faithfulness. You know, the church is an animal. I don't know how I survived 20 years in the ministry. It can only be God because I'm not strong enough for this stuff. You know, the church has almost killed me. But here I am doing what I'm doing because the Lord keeps me going. Because the Lord is my portion, and because the Lord is faithful. Amen. And so as I celebrate that verse, I want you to also grab hold of it, and I want you to bury it in the lowest chamber of your heart, and I want you to visit that verse whenever you have a crisis. Whenever you feel the wheels are coming off, whenever you feel that you cannot face the following day. And I want you to say to yourself that this is something you know in spite of how you might be feeling in that moment. Let's not trust our feelings any longer. Let's trust that which doesn't change, namely the promises of Almighty God. Because of His great love, you have not been consumed. For, he, for you, His mercies are also new every morning. Great is His faithfulness to you. You see how circumstances change all the time. You know, in a world as imperfect as this, and as a country as complicated as ours, our situations would change all the time. And I suppose on any given day there is a certain level of uncertainty and unpredictability in this land. But we finally have to arrive at that place where our feelings, where our mental state, where our emotions don't inform our concept of God, but where we believe Him for who He is. The last thing that I need to talk about when it comes to the weeping prophet is, it looks like after all was said and done, after he had finished all his renting and raving, he did come to that unshakable knowledge that God is who he said he was in the first place. In Jeremiah chapter 20, something very strange happens to the prophet. He is caught by one of the big shots of the temple. One of the priests serving at the temple in Jerusalem really, really, really didn't like Jeremiah. He wanted to get rid of the poor man. And so he had him arrested and locked up. And the poor 
prophet was even flogged a couple of times. Now, I can just imagine how graphically you would have described that little ordeal going on what he had written before that. The priest's name was Pusha, because I can see that many of you believe, don't believe me, thinking that this is not possible what I'm saying to you. But you can check all of this out in Jeremiah chapter 20, where the priest Pusha arrests Jeremiah and says to him, you know what, I'm going to have you flogged, you deserve it for the nonsense you've been speaking, and then I'm going to have you kind of locked up in the open. So it wasn't in a prison cell or anything, he was attached to a pillar. Um, as a part of the temple. And so there he was exposed to all who wanted to come and mock and deride him. Jeremiah survives this whole ordeal, however. And then somewhere in that chapter, his mood changes. He probably realizes how fortunate he is to be alive. And so he says, Let's sing to the Lord. I mean, this coming from Jeremiah is shocking, even horrifying. No one saw this coming. For Jeremiah to say, let's be happy and sing to the Lord, that's a heck of a stretch. But perhaps everything that he had been through, perhaps everything that he had overcome with the Lord's help, brought him to that point where he could say, let's rejoice in the Lord. And then in verse 13 he says, the Lord rescues the needy from the jaw of the lion. Only two chapters on, he continues the song. He continues this positive, life-giving mood. Out of place for Jeremiah, but there it is. In Lamentations 5, verse 19, probably written towards the end of his life, he says this, Lord, you reign forever. Your throne stands from one generation to the next. Now I want to know from you today, do you think that the people listening to Jeremiah took him seriously? Did it look to them as if the Lord was reigning? No, because they were sitting far from their homeland at the rivers of Babylon doing what? Weeping day and night. They weren't singing, they weren't dancing, they weren't doing cartwheels. They were sitting there in silence, in raw and real mourning for what had happened to them. So they must have looked at Jeremiah and said to him, you've been smoking something. Don't tell us how God reigns, for everything around us tells us that he can't still be on the throne. That he has gone AWOL, meaning absent without leave. They looked at what they saw around him and called the prophet a liar. He claimed that God was reigning, but to them it didn't look like he was reigning, so they were going with what they saw. When he said, O oh Lord, your throne stands forever, people must have spoken amongst each other and said, Jeremiah has gone off his rockers. There's nothing left of him. The flogging affected his brain. But then, of course, the breakthrough came. Then, of course, a new dawn rose for the people of God. And then, of course, God proved himself as if for the first time to be good to be faithful, to be someone who cannot ever deny himself. And so for whatever there is to be said about Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, at least his material ends on a climax. At least he often offers us some hope and some reassurance. 
or whether you believe this or not, perhaps you need to hear this this morning. That in your life, God still reigns. Maybe it doesn't look like it. Maybe there are all sorts of signs to the contrary. And maybe as I stand in front here saying that his throne in your life will stand from one generation to the next. Perhaps you feel like disagreeing with me, brushing it off as hogwash. You see, you don't have to believe it to be true. You don't have to agree with me at this stage. All I want to say is, watch this space. Let's not blame God for the terrible things that happened to us. For God is trying His best to make our lives work out in spite of this world being so fallen. Let's not allow our emotions to get the better of us like it happened with Jeremiah. Let's know what we believe and when to believe it most particularly. And lastly, let us trust God no matter what. Even, or should I say, especially when we cannot see the road ahead of us. Don't let what you see around you make you forget what God said.